Welcome to Steps to Life. Ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? I want to study with you something. There are many things that uh, God's people need to understand. And uh, that's why everywhere I go, I'm always preaching a completely different sermon because there, there are so many things that God's people need to understand today. And I want to study with you something this morning that is so important that in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, when the Apostle Paul lists six parts of the foundation of the Christian religion, this is part of the foundation of the Christian religion. You can read that in the first three verses of Hebrews 6. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to tell you a short story about a man who was named James. James, of course, I don't know what today, James used to be the most popular first name for a boy in the United States. I don't know if it is still. This man, however, was not born in the United States. Uh, his last name was Black. He was, he was born in Scotland in 1882. I'll tell you a little bit about James in a moment, but let's pray before we begin and study. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come to you earnestly seeking your face, praying that your spirit will speak to us as we read your word, that you'll help us to understand what we need to understand 
about the present and more especially about the future. And we pray that your spirit will work on our hearts and minds so that we will be ready for the future. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> now you heard in the children's story about a girl that was forced to leave home when she was 12 years of age. It is sad, but there are many, many awful, sad experiences that happen to people in this world. And James Black, although he was born in 1882 in Scotland, when he was only eight years old, he was kidnapped and taken to Canada. How would you like to be, if you're eight years old, how would you like to be clear on the other side of the ocean, another continent from your parents? Well, that was his situation. And in those days, they did not have the type of government social services that we have today in the United States or Canada. But in Canada, there was an elderly minister that found James and took him into his home. And so James became a Christian. And by the time when he was 16 years of age, he was the actually the leader, the president of a certain young people's society. Now, this was a Christian young people's society. And one day, he met a girl who was only 14 years of age. She was poorly dressed. And she was the daughter of a drunkard. And he invited her to join the society and to attend Sunday school. They were Sunday keepers. And she did this. And she attended Sunday school, and she attended the Young People's Society. But one evening, they were having a dedication meeting, and they called the roll of all the members in the society. Every member responded and read a Bible text. But when this girl's name was called, there was no response. James Black responded to her absence by saying that he was sad of anyone being absent when the names were called, and he was even more sad at the prospect of anyone who would be absent when their name was called for those who were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then he added this prayer. He said, Oh God, when my own name is called up yonder, may I be there to respond. He thought they should sing a hymn that was appropriate to this, and he couldn't find one in the hymnal. But on his way home, as he was thinking about this, he got home, and within 15 minutes after he got home, he took a pencil and he wrote down the following words. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of His resurrection share, when His chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. He wrote that out in 15 minutes. He had the first two stanzas. Actually, if you look in the hymnal, I think it's on page 216. There are three stanzas. He wrote them out. He wrote the stanzas. To, and then after he wrote it out, he went over to the piano, and the music just came to him, and he, he, he played it. The music, just as he played it, and the words, just as he wrote it, are still in our hymnal today. And it is a wonderful, wonderful story to think about that one day the time is coming. All of God's children from all ages, from all lands, are going to be gathered together into one place. And this is the reason that Jesus came. The Apostle John tells us that. Notice what it says in John, the 11th chapter. John, the 11th chapter. It says, it's talking about the plot to kill Jesus by Caiaphas. John 11, starting with verse 51, it says, Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation 
and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Jesus died so that he would be able to gather together all of God's children into one place. That's what the Bible says. We just read it. How this is going to happen is one of the seven mysteries that are spoken about in the New Testament. The New Testament talks about seven different mysteries. Each one of these seven divine mysteries are too large for any human mind to fully comprehend. But they are lots of fun to study. Delightful to study about these mysteries, even though we cannot fully understand them. This is one of those seven mysteries that we're going to study. It's called a great mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 55. And as I've already mentioned, it's also described by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 6 as part of the foundation of the Christian religion. And if I could just read one sentence, what Ellen White said about it. She said, the resurrection of Christ is the life of the church. I want to begin by simply reading several verses in the Bible where Jesus talked about this subject and where his apostles talked about this subject. Now sometimes verses in the Bible mean more to you when you're in a certain context than when you're in a different context. And the first verse that I'm going to read to you is a verse that I had read. In fact, I could quote it. But in 1986, my wife Evelyn and I, we were going to one of a very, very large church. In fact, it was the largest church in that union. We were members of that church. I'd been an elder in that church. And the church service was over. And so we were filing out of the church. And as we came, that church had two back entrances. You could go out either way. As we were going out of the church, that's where, you know, the ministers shake your hand just as you walk out the door. And as we were just approaching there, I looked to the right. And there was a very good friend of mine, quite a bit younger than myself, but a very good friend of mine. His brother was one of my students. And his wife was right in front of him, sitting in a wheelchair. She was 29 years old. And she was so sick, she had to have oxygen. And I turned, I looked, both, knew both of them. I turned, I looked at both of them. And he and I met eyes together. We didn't say anything. It was too sad to speak. And <clears throat> late, not too many hours later, uh, this woman had cancer. She had three children. She had cancer. And as a result of the chemotherapy, she had heart failure. She actually didn't die from cancer. She died from heart failure. And she got so bad that they took her to the hospital in Dallas. She was on oxygen. And her husband was up there with her in the hospital. It was, And uh, she said to her husband, she said, who are all these tall, shining beings in my room? He said, there's nobody here but you and me. She said, yes, there are. I can see them. He couldn't see anything. They brought supper. They brought supper for her, supper for him. She ate a good supper. He ate a good supper. And they talked till late at night. He didn't know this would be their last conversation. They visited together until late at night. And 
And they both went to sleep. He was sleeping in a chair beside her bed. And about 5 o'clock in the morning, the nurse came in, called, called alarm. They all came in. They couldn't resuscitate her. And the nurse said, I can't understand it. I was just here 10 minutes ago, and she's breathing normally. She was dead. There was nothing they could do. And so my wife and I, what could we do? We wanted to befriend this man and his family. And I went over to his house. And when I was visiting with him, when, when I walked into his house, I don't know if you've been in a situation, you could just feel that the place was empty. Have you ever been in a place like that? You could just feel it. Nobody needed to tell you anything. As soon as you walked in the door, you could feel it. It was empty. It was full of people, but it was empty. And I thought to myself, I have to do something. I have to do something to comfort this man. And so I read him this verse. Every time I read this verse, it comes flashes into my mind when I was sitting on the couch, looking that man in the face, reading him this verse. It made an indelible impression on my mind that time, even though I'd read it before. And this verse is found in John, the fifth chapter, and verses 28 and 29. This is the verse that I read to him that afternoon. John 5, 28 and 29. It says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, friends, those are the words of Jesus. Those words were spoken by somebody who does not ever make a mistake. Those words were spoken by somebody that the Bible says it's impossible for him to lie. However, I'm sorry to say that there are people in the world today that don't believe in the resurrection. I, maybe they've never studied the evidence I'm going to study, if the Lord wills, in a few minutes with you, the evidence for the resurrection. It's one, in my opinion, it is one of the most indisputable facts of all human history. Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. How do we know it's going to happen? Because Jesus Christ was raised from the tomb himself. But before we get to looking at the evidence, let's just read... One or two more things that Jesus said about it. Look in the book of Luke, the 14th chapter. We will read starting in verse 12. This is Luke 14, starting with verse 12. It says, Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you but you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. We live in a moral universe. And in the resurrection, Jesus said, you're going to be repaid what you did that was right, what you did that was good. You're going to be repaid. In fact, Let's just read a verse where Jesus said how much you're going to be repaid. Look in Matthew, the 19th chapter. Verses 27 to 29. 
Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit everlasting life. Notice, you're going to receive two rewards. The one that we usually think of is the second one that Jesus mentioned. You will inherit eternal life. That's wonderful. But in addition to inheriting eternal life, whatever you have sacrificed for Christ's sake in this world, he says, you're going to be repaid. How much are you going to be repaid? A hundredfold. I've talked about this briefly sometimes before. What would you consider a good investment? People are talking a lot these days on the Internet about investments. And uh, people, there's more and more people, you know, the baby boomers are starting to retire. So they're talking more and more about how can you get enough return on your investment so you have enough money to retire. And so there, that's a talk that's on the Internet all, all the time, every day. And uh, people say, oh, I found this investment and it returns 10%. That's 10 cents on the dollar. Have you ever had an investment that returns $100 for every dollar you put in? I never have, not in this world. Many years ago, I had a small investment for a few years that returned approximately 15 to 1. I thought, I thought it was almost like heaven, but it wasn't. It's only 15 to 1. Jesus said, whatever you have sacrificed for my name's sake, you're going to, re in addition to eternal life, you're going to have what? A hundredfold. This has been the faith of the followers of Christ ever since that time. Let's look at what one of them said about it in John the 11th chapter. John the 11th chapter. This was at the death of Lazarus. It says, this is Martha speaking, starting in verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. All of Jesus' followers knew that there would be a resurrection at the last day and that they would be raised. Jesus had promised them this in John 6. You can read it in John 6, verses 38 and 40. Jesus was speaking to a whole large group of Jews. They did not accept his sermon. They wanted deliverance from the Romans instead of the resurrection. But Jesus said to them in John 6, 39 and 40, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This was the faith of the early Christian church. This is what Peter preached about on the day of Pentecost that brought thousands of people into the Christian church. You can read that in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Look in Acts 2. Look at verse 31 and 32 and 33. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. That was the point of contention, of course, between the disciples and the Jews. Notice what it says in Acts 4, 2. 
It says the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So that's what they were preaching. They were preaching that through Jesus, you would have a resurrection from the dead. And this is what Paul preached. Notice what Paul said about it concerning the Jews in Acts 24. This was at a trial where Paul was being tried. Acts 24, verse 15. Paul says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And Paul talks about it many places in his letters. In Romans 6, 5, he says, If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, that's when you're baptized, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul himself says that this was his great hope as a Christian. Notice what he says in Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verses 7 to 11. What things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is what the Apostle Paul preached. This is what the Apostle Peter preached. Look at what Peter said about it. Look in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the first chapter. And verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to the, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he refers to this both in his first and his second epistle. But, probably the chapter in the New Testament which deals the most thoroughly with the subject of the resurrection is a long chapter in the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. If you turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, let's uh, notice several verses. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Notice what Paul preached. He says... Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Well, what is this gospel that he preached? Well, he's going to tell them in just a few words what it was. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel that Paul preached. And then he goes on to tell them how the fact of Christ's resurrection cannot really be argued because this was something that was public. In fact, he goes on to list appearances that Christ made to his followers after his resurrection. Now, interestingly... The Apostle Paul does not list them all. So you cannot find all the appearances of Christ after the resurrection to his followers just by reading 1 Corinthians 15, although he mentions several of them in verses uh, 5 to 8. Uh, if there are some here, especially children that may have never noticed all these, I'll give you the list very, very quickly, and I'll, but I'll let you 
The ones that aren't in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll let you look them up yourself. The others are in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John and the other Gospels. Here are the appearances after the resurrection. Ten. I'm not saying that the way I'm giving to you, them to you is exact order, but here are the ten appearances. Number one, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Number two, he appeared to a group of women. Number three, he appeared to Peter. Number four, he appeared to two people as they walked to Emmaus. Number five, he appeared to the twelve, except Thomas. Number six, he appeared to over 500 people at one time. Number seven, he appeared to the twelve again with Thomas. Number eight, he appeared to James. Number nine, he appeared to seven of the apostles at one time. And then finally, number ten, he walked with his disciples up Mount of Olives where he ascended 40 days after. Ten different appearances of Christ after the resurrection. And when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, and the, all the early Christians could say this, anywhere in the world where the gospel was preached, they could say to people, look, Jesus appeared after his resurrection to over 500 people, and most of them are, Paul says, most of them are still alive. You can go over there to Palestine and meet them. You can talk to them. Now, you can't do that today. But in the first few years of the Christian church, they could say to people, you can go to Palestine. There's over 500 people there that saw Jesus after his resurrection. And you can talk to these people. They knew who those people were. Paul says, most of them are still alive at the present time. That's when 1 Corinthians was written. But in spite of the fact that there were so many public appearances after the resurrection, very early in the Christian church, the devil attacked the doctrine of the resurrection. Some people said, well, he didn't really die. He just looked like he died and he was resuscitated. That, that began to be taught clear back in the first century. Because the resurrection was a powerful docu doctrine. It was a powerful teaching. Millions of people became Christians when they learned about this doctrine. This was the first time that it had been demonstrated to the whole world that there really was an answer, a future after death. It wasn't just a doctrine, it wasn't just a teaching. It had already happened and it had already been demonstrated. And Jesus told his followers that the same thing that had happened to him was going to happen to them. He was going to raise them at the last day. He, we already read in John 6. But the devil attacked this doctrine. So by the time 1 Corinthians were written, there were people that were saying that it wasn't real. There was something not real about it. And so the Apostle Paul is going to deal with this. Let's start reading verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Many years ago I was teaching a Sabbath school class and it was when I was young and brash and didn't have very good judgment. And I heard this common argument as by a, a very experienced minister. They said, well, even in this life, you're at an advantage if you're a Christian. And like I said, I was young and brash and didn't have very good judgment. So when he said that, I read in this text, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, which directly contradicted what he just said. I've learned, of course, since that time that 
uh, especially preachers and teachers, do not like anybody reading Bible text that contradicts what they've just said. But uh, that's still what the Bible says. The Bible does not teach that if you become a Christian, that everything is going to just turn up wonderful in this life. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, Jesus said to his followers, he said, in this world, you're going to have what? You're going to have tribulation. There's a popular gospel being preached today that if you become a Christian, then the Lord's going to help you become rich. Well, the Lord might help you become rich. However, the devil might help you become rich too. That's the way a lot of people have lost their souls. In this life, Paul says, if, if it's only whatever you get in this life, then you're of all men most miserable. Paul said, our goal, our life is not down here. Our, citizen is, our citizenship is up there. And it's not what happens to us in this life that is the most important. Many years ago, I asked my mother, you know when people grow up, they, they start asking all kinds of questions. And parents, some parents don't like their young people asking questions. If you don't want to be asked questions, you shouldn't have children. All children have questions. And one of the questions I had in my mind was, why did God allow all those martyrs to be martyred? I mean, I read history even as a child. And do, do you know, friends, that there have been almost for sure many, many millions of infants and small children that have been martyred. Are you aware of that? Maybe I shouldn't have brought that up. Maybe that's too painful for you. But it's true. Why did God allow that? Well, my mother said, what happens to you in this world is not the most important thing. What happens to you in this world is not the most important thing. The most important thing is, is that you have a part in the first resurrection. It'd be better to be martyred as a child in this world and be part of the first resurrection than live to be 90 years old or 100 years old and not be saved. Well, that's something that some people haven't thought about. We, so much of the time we're tempted to we, want to, we want to have long life. We want to have riches. We want to have honor. You know, this has been a desire of mankind, as far as I can tell, ever since the beginning. In fact, the Lord told Solomon, he says, because you did not ask for long life, because you did not ask for riches, but you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you these other things. That used to be a side benefit. And by the way, when it comes to long life and riches, if you're saved, you're going to have all those things. You're going to have long life that will never end, and you're going to have riches. But all of that won't do any good if you're not saved. <laughs> so, Paul says, if all you get is what you get in this world, well, then you're of all men most miserable. But, he says, that's not all you get because Christ has been raised from the dead. Notice what he says in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. In the Jewish economy... It is very interesting for those of you that like to study religious history. Everything in the new covenant, in the plan of salvation, was typified in the old covenant. Is there anything in the old covenant about the time of trouble? Well, yes. Is there anything in the old covenant about the second coming? Yes. Is there anything in the old covenant about the resurrection? Yes. They had ceremonies that typified all these things that took place at least every year. And every year, before they harvested their grain, they took a sickle and they cut the first fruit off and they brought that to the temple and that, that was given as a gift. There's a whole ceremony in the Old Testament in regard to the first fruits. You can study it out in the book of Leviticus. And what was that all about? What was that ceremony about? 
the ceremony of the first fruits was a ceremony that represented the resurrection of Christ. As Jesus said, if a grain of wheat remains, it remains alone, but if it's cast into the ground, it brings forth much, much fruit. He was talking about his death and his resurrection. Read that in John, the 12th chapter. So, the Jews every year had this ceremony of the first fruits. And the ceremony of the first fruits took place on the third day after the Passover. The Passover was on the 14th, and then there was the 15th, the, ceremony, the feast, beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then the 16th was the offering of the first fruits. And of course, the resurrection of Christ took place on that very day. Then they had the Feast of Weeks, and at the end of the Feast of the Weeks, at the very end of the Feast of the Weeks, on that very day was Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles. And the Apostle Paul refers to that here in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Christ is the firstfruits. He was the firstfruits, and to prove it, you know, there, not only was Jesus raised, but from every generation, from the time of Adam up to the first advent, in every generation, there were some people that were raised as trophies and as a pledge of what was going to happen in the future. And the Bible says that, well, let's read it in the Bible. I don't want anybody to think I'm making something up. If you haven't studied this out yourself, look in Matthew 27. Starting with verse 50. Matthew 27, Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when Jesus was here, he raised some people. He raised Lazarus. He raised the son of the widow of Nain. He raised Jairus' daughter. But those people were all raised to a temporary life again in this world. But this resurrection, the people that were raised when Christ was raised, they were not raised for a temporary life again in this world. They were raised to eternal life. They're in heaven today. We don't know their names because we haven't been told. By the way, there's a very good reason we haven't been told. Human people are so idolatrous that if God told us their names, there'd be people that'd be praying to Him and worshiping Him. But God hadn't told us their names. But these people were raised as a pledge. You, you know, all know what a pledge is, don't you? Used to be. I don't know how much they're doing that now because I haven't bought a house recently. But it used to be when you bought a house or a piece of real estate, before you actually close the deal, you had to give a pledge, and we called the pledge earnest money. It's even used that way in the King James Bible. It's took, the Holy Spirit is called a pledge or earnest of our inheritance. And once you put down the earnest money, you either had to go ahead and buy the house or lose the earnest money. That used to be the way it was. These people that were raised at Jesus' resurrection are a pledge that He's going to resurrect all of His followers when He comes again. In fact, if it didn't happen, it would destroy the government of God because it would prove that God was a liar. But it's going to happen. And so, Paul is pleading with these people who had gotten so mixed up. And this is what he says. Each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And then he goes on talking about the awful effects of denying the resurrection in verses 39, uh, 29 to 34. And then he starts to address the doubters. 
you and I are living in the age of unbelief. That's what I call it. It's interesting, all people, in fact, the Roman Catholics know this too. If you look in the Roman Catholic textbooks about the Dark Ages, they don't call it the Dark Ages, they call it the Middle Ages. I'm a Protestant, so I call it the Dark Ages. They refer to the Dark Ages as the Age of Faith. Now, there were all kinds of arguments about theology and all sorts of things during the Dark Ages, but... If you read history, what they were arguing about was not whether God existed or something like that. But we're living in the age of unbelief. We're not living in the age of faith. We're living in the age similar to the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, people didn't believe Noah's message. That was an age of unbelief. And Jesus said it would be like that before the second coming. And Peter says it over and over again. In 2 Peter 3, he talks about the fact that just before the end, in the last days, there will be scoffers and that they will deny that the world came into existence by the Word of God. Are there people today that deny that the world came into existence by the Word of God? And by the way, if you've ever tried to prove something to these people, you might want to keep in mind that the Bible says that it is by faith that we know that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. It's not the wisest thing to try to absolutely prove it to somebody. Because we understand that by faith. We were not there, and we don't have a picture of it. We believe it because God said so. But did you know? If you have to deal, if any of you have to deal with somebody who's struggling with unbelief, you don't want to deal with creation at first. You know what you would be wiser to start studying with them first? The resurrection. You know why? You don't need to be a believer to believe in the resurrection. You don't even need to believe in the Bible. Did you know? Now, I didn't bring it with me. I have it in my library. The Roman government, and it's recorded in the annals of history of the pagan Roman Empire, they know, and they wrote it down in the history, they know that there was a man that lived in Judea whose name was Jesus of Nazareth, and they wrote about it, and they wrote to the Roman Empire and discussed it. Not only did they know that, the Roman government knew and recorded it, and it's recorded in secular history, that Pontius Pilate, took this man, Jesus of Nazareth, and crucified him. The Roman government knows that. You don't know it? The Roman government knew it. How come you don't know it? Well, somebody says, I believe that he was crucified. I can't deny that. The Roman, even the Roman government knows that. Everybody knows that. Jesus of Nazareth was a historical person. It's not some imagination. Nobody that has a mind and is, is, a, is willing to look at evidence can deny that there was a man that lived in those days by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and nobody can deny that Pontius Pilate crucified him. Well then, let's ask some questions. If that can't be denied, let's ask some questions. Number one, the Jews said that the disciples stole him away at night while the hundred Roman soldiers were sleeping. Now let's think of that for a moment. What's the, what is the penalty for a Roman soldier sleeping on duty? What has been the common penalty in armies all over the world for thousands of years for a, a soldier that is hired to be a watchman and be on duty as a watchman at night and they fall asleep? What is the penalty of that? Death. There's a good reason for that, by the way. If a soldier that's supposed to be a watchman goes to sleep, it endangers the entire army. You could have the entire army at risk. And so that's the, the common penalty for, since ancient times for a soldier that falls asleep on duty. It was even that way in the Civil War in the United States. Now let's just think that through a minute. If that is the penalty for falling asleep, how, what are, do you think the chances are that 100 soldiers would all fall asleep at the same time? And not only that, When they fell asleep, they were in such a sound sleep that when this massive stone, by the way, it would take probably 10 or 20 men at least to push the stone out, that that stone could be moved by the disciples and they not even know it. 
Is that possible? But that's not all. You remember the Bible records that that stone was sealed with a Roman seal. What would have happened to the disciples? If, if all the disciples had been, a, if, if the disciples had come and stolen him away and the soldiers were all asleep, when they found out what the disciples had done, what would be the penalty for breaking the Roman seal? All of the disciples would have been arrested, even if the soldiers were asleep. Why were none of the soldiers arrested? Why, why, were, why were none of the apostles arrested? All the Jews would have had to do to disprove the resurrection would be to arrest the disciples and force them to reveal where the body was. But this was never attempted. How come they never attempted it? Or all the Jews would have had to do would simply produce the body. The disciples said he was resurrected, just produce the body. That proves he's not resurrected. But that was never attempted. How come? You don't think that they had ability, and the Romans had ability to search and find bodies that somebody had tried to hide in those? You don't think they had ability to do that? And then something else. What was it that changed the apostles, who when Jesus was arrested, they were so afraid that they all ran away? But now, read the first few chapters of the book of Acts, and when they arrest them, and they beat them, and they threatened to kill them, and they put them in prison. It doesn't do any good. They're so fearless that notice what, it said, what happens here in, in Acts, the fifth chapter. Acts, the fifth chapter. Verse 28. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey them. What changed the apostles from a bunch of fearful men who would run when Jesus was even arrested? So you can do anything you want to. You can beat them. You can put them in prison. You can threaten them with death. You can do anything they want. They're going to tell you the truth. And what are they going to tell you? They're going to say, the one we serve is risen from the dead. He's at the right hand of the Father. We've seen him. We've witnessed it. We've talked to him. And their testimony was so powerful that within just a few years, there were millions of people all over the world. Are you aware of the fact that Historians have estimated that by 100 A.D. that somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent of the Roman Empire were Christians. Thousands, millions of people all over the world became Christians. Why? It was because of the teaching of the resurrection. That's why. There was the public evidence, as Paul says, over 500 at one time saw him. And then, of course, there is the conversion of Paul himself. Look what he says about this in Acts 26, starting with verse 12. I was journeying to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul... Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Friend, would you like to have a part in that inheritance of those who are sanctified through faith in Jesus? 
In just the next couple of minutes, I want to read to you some very exciting statements from the pen of Ellen White about this subject. He said, The voice that cried from the cross, It is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of the sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus will it be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves were opened. But at His second coming, all the precious dead shall hear His voice and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise His church and glorify it with Him above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Those who had been raised were to be presented to the universe as a pledge of the resurrection of all who believe in Christ as their personal Savior. The victory of the sleeping saints will be glorious on the morning of the resurrection. Satan's triumph will end, while Christ will triumph in glory and honor. The life giver will crown with immortality all who come forth from the grave. The fact of Christ's resurrection was to be the great truth around which all the faith and hope of the church would center. Oh, friend, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. That's the reason for the Christian religion. We know from prophecy that this resurrection is coming soon, that Jesus is coming soon. And the resurrection of Christ is the life of the church. This last one from 10 Manuscript Releases, page 317. The final resurrection to judgment will complete on the one hand the triumph of Christ and His church, and on the other will be the destruction of Satan and his followers. Time will be the only sure revealer of God's plan. Oh, friend, God looks at your heart. How is your heart today? Are you ready for the future? If you're a Christian, you can be ready for the future and you don't need to be afraid no matter what happens because it looks in this world right now like the devil is winning. People are steeped in sin and going deeper in sin and they're sick and dying all around. But the time is coming when everything's going to be changed. The devil's triumph will be ended, and Christ will triumph forever. And you want to be part of that triumph, and you can be, if you choose to accept Him today as your personal Lord and Savior. Remember, eternal life is not promised to everybody in this world. It is only promised to those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is the only way to ensure that you will have eternal life. Let us pray before we sing our closing song. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are so frail to study or understand or present the truth that we have been studying. But Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will impress the truth of what we've been studying about on our minds. Help us to realize that everything in this world, even if we think that we are young today, that it will all soon be over. But there is a future for those who believe in Jesus, those who entrust their lives to Him as the Lord of their life and their Savior from sin. We pray that You will help us to understand what is involved in allowing Jesus to be the Lord of our life. Help us to realize what is involved in following Him and to be obedient to Him to call Him our Lord and Master so that He can deliver us from the guilt and power of sin and give to us the inheritance of eternal life that come to all of His followers. May we all be ready for that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name by the greatness of His might and the strength of His power, not one is missing. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. 
Let your glory be above all the earth. 